you could have made precisely the same comment, uh, s simply changing a single word uh, to, from God or a personal God to Poseidon. Uh, and without any change in sense, really. And I, and I, I, I have said this before publicly, and, and Richard Dawkins has, has said uh, more times than he cares to count, I'm sure, that, that everyone knows what it's like to be an atheist with respect to Zeus. We all reject Zeus out of hand. We, w we would resist mightily any encroachment into public policy that tried to constrain scientific research out of deference to the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, or any other Zeus worship. And... Um, you, can, you could say no scientific study has ruled out the existence of Poseidon. Um, and yet this, this analogy, which I'm now drawing between Poseidon and the pers personal Christian God or the Jewish God or the Muslim God, uh, really strikes uh, the theists, Christians, Jews, and Muslims, as a total non sequitur. Um, so it, as an aside, I might say that, that I now get hate mail from people who actually believe in Poseidon which is, you know, quite a surprise. I mean, R Richard and I co confidently trot out this, this analogy, saying, you know, we all know that Poseidon doesn't exist. Uh, Christians or Jews or Muslims, like yourself, th think it a totally spurious analogy, and yet, you know, the, the hate mail comes pouring in to my email box from, from neo-pagans who, who, you know, I've been called a racist for, for uh, uh, you know, denying the validity of these religious beliefs. So what you have on your side are sheer numbers of subscribers, uh, 2 billion Christians, 1.3 billion Muslims. Um, it's, uh, that personal God is compatible with, with, with an endless amount of progress in science, and yet the, the mood you feel the, about uh, Poseidon, the, 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 the reflexive rejection of Poseidon is the mood that uh, could extend to, to the, the God of Abraham and, I th and should extend. Jim Woodward. Um, this is Jim Woodward from Caltech. Uh, yeah. Um, I was struck by the fact that the, um, the neural areas you mentioned in connection with religious and out-of-body experience don't seem to overlap all that much with the you may, you may have a different view of this, but they, they don't seem to overlap all that much with the usual suspects that come up in when people do, when you do, do a neural imaging of people who are engaged in moral reasoning tasks. Um, you know, so like in the latter case, it's yeah. things like insula and orbital frontal cortex and ACC and so on and so forth. And I wonder if you, would you be prepared to draw any conclusions about that, about, from that about the relationship between uh, ethics and religious belief? I mean, is it conceivable that you're just looking at sort of two really somewhat different uh, systems here? Yeah, I mean, the, we talked earlier about ethics, and I was talking about empathy and mirror neurons. Uh, they are found to, in the frontal structures, but they're also found in parietal structures. And I think one of the mistakes is to assume that if there's a specialized system of neurons or circuits, they have to be localized in one part of the brain. Uh, you know, they could be distributed and yet form part of one complex uh, system of neurons. I mean, this is a, is a recurring debate, you know, modularity versus is it distributed. And sometimes it can be distributed in different parts of the brain, but functionally it's modular. And I think that's true of, uh, especially something like religious belief, I think there are many layers to it. There is the emotional fervor connected with it, and then there is the more confabulatory, and again, I don't mean to demean, sound like I'm, you know, debunking it, but confabulatory aspect of constructing a story to account for these emotional upheavals in your brain, and there are all the cultural overtones of religion. So it's unlikely there's one little God spot. There are many different regions of the brain involved in many aspects of religious belief. But as a biologist, you want to know what parts are involved. Just saying, oh, the whole brain is involved doesn't get you anywhere. You know, just, think, just as if you say, well, pigs resemble, pig, piglets resemble pigs, so the whole pig is involved. But when, once you get to the chromosome, you know that the chromosome is involved, not the whole pig. So. I mean, I agree with you that it's distributed, but not entirely in the whole brain. There are specific systems which are specialized, including uh, parts of the front, frontal structures. Yeah, the hour is late, but there's just one more. Let's take one more question from Darren. Well, this is a, more of sort of a comment on the, the general yeah, issue. You could, of, just, um, just say who you are. Yeah, can. Darren Schreiber um, at UCSD in the political science department and mixing a little bit of neuroscience in there as well. Um, I have had a sort of divine experience um, in a previous a, a number of years ago, and I um, I don't know what part of the brain it was coming through. It was uh, I, I had had a vision um, at one point that that appeared to me to ha later on in, in reflection to have 
fairly deep spiritual significance with my life. And could you could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I had actually a I had a I had a vision of a passage from the Bible. Um, it, it, I didn't know what the significance of, what, of it was at the moment. Um, I was meditating. Um, I was doing that every day for for a very long period of time to to cope with a, an emotional uh, trauma, and had a, just a vision of just this set of, uh, of uh, Bible, a set of Bible verses like you see in the top corner if you open up Gideon's. And, um, Were you in a hotel? I, no, 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 but uh, <laughs> I wasn't in a hotel. I wasn't on mescaline, and I, uh, I don't believe I was having a temporal uh, lobe epilepsy. Um, and I, can't go into, I won't go into the whole experience of, uh, of why that I, I saw that to be a, a message to me. It, was, it had a number of features of it. This particular verse, when I looked it up uh, later, it was actually like two days later, when I thought, well, this was weird. I've never had that kind of a vision. I wonder what it means. And, and then had a Pentecostal about three weeks later explain it to me. And when they said what they thought that this meant, um, I went from being in a very normal affective state to bawling my eyes out. Um, and it was really shocking. Um, for me to have experienced something uh, that dramatic of a shift of an, uh, in my own affective state. One of the, having recently gone through another uh, personal emotional uh, tragedy in the last uh, number of months, I've been searching for, uh, I, I was talking to a friend of mine who was a pastor and asked him, it was talking with him about this, and, and he said, you know, Darren, sometimes God brings us into the unknown. And I think being in the unknown is a very uncomfortable place for us to be as scientists. I mean, this is what, we, what drives us often, is to get out of that place of the unknown. And I, I thought later about the, uh, the story um, of Job in the Bible. And Job in this story is being placed in a, in a horrible position. And he's faced with the unknown. And I, as I was contemplating that today, I was thinking that there are sort of four responses that, that I'm, I think, called to as a person of faith um, when I'm placed in the unknown. And one of those is to keep searching. Um, I, don't, I, I think that I, I feel called to keep searching, that we as, as, as people of faith are called to keep searching, not to just give up, not to just say, well, we don't understand, but to keep searching. A second is a striving for humility, and that's something that I've felt has been lacking often in the discussions today. Um, if we don't have humility as scientists, it's very difficult to acknowledge when we're wrong. It's very difficult to, to realize that there's something else that is unknown, that should drive us to the next, the next set of hypotheses, the next set of inquiries. A third thing that I feel called to as a person of faith um, in when facing the unknown is to love others. Um, it's, a, again, something that's it's fairly simple, but, um, but again, also something that I've been hearing as, as lacking in some, in some of the discussion today. Uh, I think a, a lack of respect for the belief systems of others, um, a, a lack of the respect for faith that others have, um, or the choices that, that others make in their lives. The, f the fourth thing that I feel called to when I listen to the story of Job um, in the Bible is a call to be present with the unknown. And that sometimes there are just things that we just, we just don't know. Um, and that's something that, again, is uncomfortable. It's not a place I want to be as a scientist. Um, but sometimes everything that we know about science tells us that we're just going to be in that place of the unknown. Yes, I would like to humbly and respectfully disagree with you. My name is Annie Drian, and um, I'm a founder of Cosmo Studios and very and honored to have been the longtime collaborator of Carl Sagan. And I'd like to say that I think it's just the opposite of what you're saying from my perspective, humbly. One is that I think that science has a, ha, tolerates the unknown in a way that religion doesn't. My argument is not with people who search for God. My argument is with people who feel that our understanding of God is completed. And those are the people who make so much of our existence on this planet such a hell because they really think that they have the right to kill other people, to hurt them because of what they understand God's will to be. That's a very destructive thing. So science, science is the whole methodology of science is saying that we are not permitted these absolute truths that religion s pretends to have, that we do not know the answer to these questions. And not only that, but the little that we think we do know, if you can prove us wrong, we'll give you our highest reward. And that's part of the methodology. That's part of the whole functioning of the system itself. So yes, in answer to what Joan was saying earlier, 
scientists do terrible things. Science, scientists have biases. Religious people do terrible things and they have biases. But absolutely intrinsic to the whole scientific, the methodology of science is that error correcting mechanism which says we must never lose sight of that. That's not in religion, that's not present at all. Talk about humble. It's the fact that we do science and that we can bring ourselves to see that little tiny earth in Carolyn's presentation. That is humility. What science has done for us spiritually is that it has been the only thing that I know of that has compelled us to wean ourselves of our infantile need for centrality. And that was present, that is very much the essence of so many religious formulations of where we come from, why we came to be. It's the sign of mental, mental health that we can bear to think that this planet was perfectly fine for four and a half billion years without us. That cosmic evolution goes on for 13 and a half billion years before we even get here. How long have we been in science? How long have we systematically been looking at nature? Not even 400 years. And yet science gets us out to Enceladus. It takes us out of the solar system. It enables us to wean ourselves of that spiritual narcissism which compelled us to be at the center of everything. So when it comes to humility, when it comes to uh, a tolerance for ambiguity and for the unknown. I think science worships the unknown. I think scientists are most comfortable in that place of not knowing. And that's where they live. And that's, that's the great strength of science. So I would respectfully disagree.